Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the Somerville Council Update, President of the Council, Matt McLaughlin. And joining us today is Councillor J.T. Scott, representing Ward 2 in the City of Somerville. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, as good as I can be. How are you, Jeff? Very good, very good. It's a sunny day in May. Councillor Scott, your first time coming on the Council Update. How are you and the family doing? Oh, every day is a holiday, Joe. Every day is a holiday. Uh, yeah, well, the holiday is coming up. The holiday Memorial Day weekend is coming up. I wish everybody uh, safety and good health. Matt, as our usual, um, our usual procedure goes, you had a, another public health and public safety meeting last night. Do you want to give us the recap on that? Thanks, Joe. Yeah, we have a weekly public health and safety meeting uh, to deal with COVID-19. Uh, a lot of the information I'm going to give you can be found on the Somerville website, somervillema.gov, and click on the coronavirus link. Um, as of today, uh, as of what is today, May, <laughs> May, May 19th. 19th, as of May 19th, uh, we've had 787 confirmed cases of COVID-19. 499 people have recovered and there have been 20 deaths. Uh, so that's an increase of three deaths since the last time we spoke. Uh, the biggest announcement um, of the week is that all large events in the city of Somerville have been canceled for the year. Uh, so there will be no public events, uh, no fluff fest, no carnival, no parades from now until December 31st. So that's a major announcement. It's Disappointing uh, for a lot of people, but it is in uh, the best public safety interest. Uh, city buildings will also be closed uh, until June 1st. The previous date was May 18th, uh, which is the big rollout date for a lot of people. Uh, the city has decided that June 1st at the earliest city buildings will be open. Uh, they are starting, as we discussed last week, a phased reintroduction of construction. Uh, and then on May, started on May 25th, uh, they're looking at hospitals and medical services, as well as curbside retail um, potentially opening on May 25th. Um, and the big thing is, you know, the governor recently put out his announcement about uh, phased rollouts and the city's assessing his rollout and are gonna come out with their own. Uh, they, they advertise it as being a little more cautious because we're such a densely populated city, uh, but we're gonna be taking our cues and our advice from, uh, the, from the state and making our own decisions on the city level. Um, let's see, city construction will be allowed uh, starting May 25th in certain cases. Uh, if you're doing construction inside of your house and it's a small private uh, project, uh, that will be allowed as well as some non-emergency co uh, contract work and more announcements on that on June 1st. Uh, as I've mentioned last time, uh, universal testing for COVID-19, you can get that at some little hospital. I had it last week myself. Uh, it was a very unpleasant experience and I highly recommend it for everybody. Um, I think it's important for people to get this test so we have a good idea of where we're at. Again, if the whole nation was uh, being tested, we'd be far, much further ahead on this than we are right now. If people are interested in getting tested, uh, you can call 617-665 2928 and do that between Monday and Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. And then finally, uh, I mentioned last week as well, uh, the city has handed out masks, free masks, at the following locations from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, so between those times, uh, let's see, you, you can uh, go to the East Somerville Police sta Substation, which is 81 Broadway, uh, and that'll be inside or outside depending on the rain. Uh, the police station at the intersection of Broadway and Temple Street. Uh, that's not a police station, actually. That's a just regular uh, Broadway and Temple Street. Distrib distribution will be moved to the Public Safety Building on 220 Washington Street if it's raining. And the Teal Square Police Substation at 1116 Broadway. Uh, so that's all the announcements I have for this week. And I'm here to answer any questions. And we have Councilor Scott here as well. Great. JT, before we get into, as chair of the finance committee for the city council, before we start talking about some of the budgetary implications for the city moving forward, I wanted to get your take and Matt's take on the governor's phased in rollout that was announced just yesterday on the 18th. There is um, acceptance of how he's doing it. There is some hesitancy. And then there is pushback that 
some folks think he's moving too fast. I want to get your individual take. So JT, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Well, I mean, uh, I appreciate the question. I, I, I think, um, you know, when there's a question of governance, um, one thing that I think we all really want to see is uh, a steady hand. Whether or not you agree with the direction the ship is pointed, you want to know there's the captain is guiding it where he wants to go. Um, so the, the question about the plan really for me is twofold, one of which is, uh, is it going into the, the direction that I agree with? Um, and then secondly, based on the direction that the governor wants it to go, is it going to get us there well? Uh, and I think the, the, I think the plan honestly has problems on both fronts. Um, you know, when you look at the rollout, it's a, it's a bit of a dog's breakfast. Uh, when you look at the guidelines that have been posted, uh, you know, I, I've spent an enormous amount of time looking at the information you know, the CDC puts out, uh, that Ohio, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, other states that are reopening have been given uh, to different businesses. And I, I gotta say, I, everything in the package feels rushed. It doesn't feel like it was really put together um, with the kind of clarity that I think people need to make choices about their lives. Um, you know, some of these questions also came up in our, in our public health and public safety meeting and in our finance meeting, which is, you know, for businesses that are now told, okay, you're allowed to be open. Um, if, if they do decide to open and individual employees now are faced with choices about looking at their employers and saying, is this safe? Um, the question for them is, all right, this is clearly not a safe rollout. This is clearly not well thought out. I, I can't do that and risk my family members. I can't risk myself. I don't, or, or risk my customers. Um, are they eligible for unemployment still? because now it becomes an optional situation. Similarly, for uh, childcare, childcare isn't part of this initial rollout. So all childcare facilities are still closed except for the emergency essential worker stand-up facilities that have been put in place. But for the barbers and nail salons now that are going to be open, is that essential childcare accessible to everybody who works in a barbershop now? Uh, and there has been no guidance. There's nothing published about that. And I have to think the answer is no, in which case you're telling people, okay, you can go back to work, but uh, good luck figuring out what to do with your kids. Right. So I, I think from a technical standpoint, it's got some serious flaws. And for somebody who, you know, kind of wants to be the manager in chief of Massachusetts, I think that uh, is, a, is a real failure um, from the governor's plan. So I have deep concerns about the implementation as it's, as it's been presented to us. And I understand everybody's moving fast. We're all trying to get a lot done really quickly. Um, but sometimes speed is our enemy. And I think that goes to the other question, which is the policy direction. You know, what direction is the ship headed? And um, quite frankly, I think from a policy standpoint, the plan, the plan's priorities look like what would happen if you got a bunch of business owners together and didn't include any workers. So um, I, I think it's... Um, it's not the direction that I would steer things in. Obviously, everybody's hurting, uh, and you know we, we need to take better care of our people. We need to do everything we can to, to make sure that we get a public health response that addresses this crisis. Um, but let, let me ask Matt about the ship estate here. Matt, you're a passenger on the ship estate, Massachusetts. You think the Captain Baker is steering us in the right direction, or is he taking us too fast in an ice, I'll tell you, so, iceberg laden ocean. So like JT, you know, I'm not an expert on this stuff. So I try to follow the guidelines of the experts. Um, and I do give, I, I give a lot of credit to the executives in the situation because it's such a difficult time. You have people yelling at you from every direction saying what you should and shouldn't do. And it's an unprecedented situation for everybody. So I try to give them a lot of leeway, uh, but as Councilor Scott mentioned, you know, I, I kind of feel like because they're getting yelled at by so many people, they're making decisions based off popularity or based off what people want instead of what's necessary. So I look at, you know, phased reintroduction of places of worship. Um, that's not an economic decision. That's not a uh, health decision that seems more like a popular decision to me that you know people are demanding this so you have to give it to them and is that the wisest decision right now 
uh, and then construction, uh, he already, the governor already allowed construction during the coronavirus and is now, and even went head to head with our mayor about allowing construction or not. Uh, so these seem to be economic decisions or popularity decisions that I don't think are public health decisions. And I do respect that it's a very difficult decision. We got a lot of people out of work, a lot of people trying to survive right now, a lot of people just desperate to get back to normal. Uh, but in Somerville, at least, we're trying to listen to the experts, listen to the scientists, and put human life first. You know, I, I think that's well put by both of you, is that there are so many factors, so many complex issues that have to be worked out. But I often ask business owner friends, small business owner friends, I don't have any more corporate titans that are friends of mine. I often ask them, you're pushing to get back to work. What happens if you are wrong and this thing resurges and you have to close again? Almost to a person, they're saying that event alone could be catastrophic for them. So I, I tend to be, in my old age, I tend to be more cautious about things, knowing that I have... Um, maybe 30 more years under my belt than either one of you is that um, I would prefer to protect my own health and the health of our employees and the health of the public rather than the expediency of a political answer. So I, I want to get back to the purpose of today is to talk about Somerville's health. Um, obviously we have done, we collectively have done a pretty good job in terms of the infection rates, hospitalization rates, death rates. Um, and I think a lot of that goes to all of the folks that were involved in this city in shutting it down as quickly as we did. The steps that we took, including our medical fo our folks at Cambridge Health Alliance, the folks on the council, the school committee, the mayor's uh, executive staff. So when you look at what happened in other municipalities in this state, and other folks across the country. I think we all have more work to do, but we should not hang our heads about the work that we have done. Back to the budget, which is gonna be, um, whether you are government or you are private business, these are the times that will try men's souls. So let's go back to the man who's gonna to have to be looking deep and hard at finance for the city, um, the budget, process has been upended from the state standpoint uh, and from the city standpoint. JT, if you don't mind, if you could just kind of walk us through a little bit what the procedures were pre-COVID and then what you anticipate going forward over the next month or so for the city budget. Uh, sure. I, you know, just, although I, you also just broke my heart, you know, talking about a couple things, you know, with the, the personal budgets, you know, the households are having to work through uh, the small business owners, the predominantly local small business owners that operate here in Somerville, uh, and and I'm one of those too. And you know, it's boy, there was you said a mouthful, Joe. Let me let me put it that. But uh, you know, prior to this year, at least in in my experience, uh, although I'm sure Councillor White could give us a little bit more perspective, um, you know, this would be about the time when budgets would be getting finalized for the next year. Uh, the, in the first week of June, you know, sometime June 1 to 5, the budget would get presented to the city council for the next fiscal year. Our fiscal years run from, you know, July to June. And there would be a period of time where the city council would meet as a whole and interview departments. And it was really more of a, well, for lack of a better word, a dog and pony show. Uh, presentations about what we did last year, what we want to do next year. And it's a beautiful budget make no mistake, the document itself wins all kinds of awards for its clarity and its expressiveness. Um, and, you know, in terms of people who may check in once a year, your, uh, your Easter and Christmas uh, city government followers, for, for lack of a better term, you know, it's a great time to check in. What's happening in the city? What are our departments doing? Where are we spending our money? And, and, and you know, what are our goals for the next year? It's uh, so counselors use that as a good opportunity to interact directly with the uh, with department heads and kind of at the end provide a wish list of uh, maybe where they'd like to see the ship steered a little bit different now 
that process takes an entire month. Uh, there are countless hours dumped into it. Um, but ultimately, at the end of it, the city council has very limited authority. We can't add money to different items. We can't allocate money to priorities that we feel are important or to create positions that our, our constituents are demanding. Um, the only thing we can do is cut the budget, which does have a material impact, right? If we do cut our overall budget, it cuts the property taxes that people end up having to pay. But um, it, it makes it a very frustrating experience and has been uh, very frustrating and, and limited input from the city council. It, it really is the captain that steers the ship. Um, so Council McLaughlin and I this year really uh, had a different vision of how, how we wanted to approach the budget. And that was to engage people that don't normally engage with that budget process, really go out, connect with our constituencies, and bring the feedback earlier on to the process. So actually very early this year, we started having discussions with um, the entire auditing team and with the mayor about saying, okay, let's, let's bring, instead of just having every department head submit their wish list of what they'd like to do this year to the mayor, let's get that early and have the city council also take a look at that and say, hey, man, boy, this is highlighted. This is what we need. Have our city councilors go out and interact with our wards, with our constituencies, because even the at-large uh, uh, councilors have people that they really resonate with. I mean, they have a section of the electorate that just says, I'm going out and voting for councilor X every time, no matter what, because I know that person is the one I can call. And I, I think that's important. Um, so it was, it was projected to be a much more collaborative process. Now, obviously, we are in a very different world. I still think it's important for that kind of feedback to happen though. So uh, as with most questions, there's multiple parts to it. I'd say how things are changing right now is that in addition to getting the priorities, getting the whole budget laid out by now, from a technical standpoint, we don't know what revenues are gonna be next year. And that's not just city revenues like building permits, or parking tickets, which we're not writing anymore, thankfully, um, but also meals taxes, hotels taxes. While we have most of our restaurants operating far below capacity on takeout only basis or not operating at all, same thing with the hotels. You know, those have significant impacts uh, to, our, to our revenue. Even more so is the state aid that comes in, the portion of our state taxes that flow back to the city Right. And JT, if I could jump in here, last year we got about $50 million from the state. Uh, do not count on that this year. That, well, that's exactly right, Joe. I mean, we're looking, a couple of weeks ago we were looking at it being down to $40 million. Now we're looking lower than that. We're going to be, we're going to have a three handle on that. And that's, that's so a giant. Yeah, if I could, JT, I just kind of want to frame it for the listeners. You know, the city budget uh, clocks in at around a quarter of a billion dollars a year. Um, in, in the past three years, it was 234 million, then up to 241 million. Last year, it's passed a quarter of a billion, it was 255 million. Out of that, the vast majority of the money that the city takes in is through property taxes, whether those are residential or commercial. But there's also a big nugget in there of state aid, state <laughs> revenue that comes into us. And all of the other line items that you've described, um, if we lose a good chunk of the state aid and we lose all that other those other sources of revenue, we're going to have to make we meaning collectively the mayor, the council, the residents, and the businesses of the city are going to have to come to the cold hard fact that cuts will have to be made. And as you know, um, you know, in a couple of other things I do, I run a budget too. And the largest nut in any of those budgets are wages and benefits. So, and this is not dealing with the school committee side of things because we're gonna have them on tomorrow, Superintendent Skipper, she's gonna be talking about the education side, but purely from city government side, any way, any shape that we can estimate what the decrease in that budget is gonna look like, well, I think I think I can give you the, the rough shape. Again, there were there were a couple hours of finance committee meeting last night. So that was a great discussion to kind of get the take on the auditing side of the house, the you know, the mayor's bookkeeping crew. You know, and they're looking at a fifteen million or more shortfall, you know, so anywhere from seven to ten percent we might be seeing in terms of a reduction in the city's budget. Now that being said, 
that doesn't necessarily translate directly to we need to cut positions or we're cutting salaries by 10% or we're cutting 10% of the, of the city's programs. There's lots of different ways to, to make that up. And, you know, everybody's got their own predilections. But as anybody who's followed the city budget uh, for some time knows, we have been aggressive at setting at raising the tax rate. But as a result, in setting aside funds uh, that are in free cash and that roll into different stabilization funds. Now, to this point, we've spent a lot of that money to kind of spin up the flywheel on different capital improvement projects around the city. And it's entirely time to pump the brakes on those things, in my humble opinion, because those are projects that absolutely have merit, but do what is the merit of that weighed against uh, cutting somebody's salary or eliminating somebody's position or eliminating a service that people vitally rely on in the city? And those are the kind of priority decisions that we're gonna have to make here. I would much rather have those discussions though than to go to every employee in the city of Somerville and say, I'm sorry, buddy, you're taking a 10% haircut. Because I don't think that's, I just don't think that's an equitable way to do that. And I think this is the time when as, when times get tight anywhere, you have to take a close look at that. But even beyond that discussion is the larger question of, well, why do we do the budgeting the way we do? I mean, obviously municipal finance is governed by state law here, but there are incredible varieties of tools. We, we've been discussing uh, about 20 different regulatory and legislative tools that we could pursue at the state level that would give municipalities more flexibility to engage with this crisis. Um, Jay, to you, I think you're alluding to the fact that the state may give municipalities permission to do short-term budgets, like a three-month rolling budget or six-month budget, and then revisit it and come back with your projections. Well, that's true, and I think that's actually prudent. I mean, right now, the state is probably going to be rolling on a monthly budget for a chunk of the next fiscal year. And if the state can't see far enough into their future to project what money they'll have on hand for programs, what money they'll have for state and local aid, what money they'll have for schools, I think it's very difficult to anticipate that Somerville has clearer vision. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna call it hubris. I'm gonna say that if that's the case at the state level, it certainly seems to make some sense to approach it that way here. But with that said, uh, the, the downside of going with a full year budget there is if you do make those decisions that you're going to cut programs, you're going to cut positions, and later you find you've got the room to add them back, well, it's difficult to steer that ship. It's certainly not impossible. You know, all budgets can be adjusted. But I would say even more than just the option to go to a shorter term budget, the question is about uh, how we bond, how we finance. Right now, cities can't run deficits. Cities can't run deficits for anything other than snow removal. And if there's a time to do that, this might be it, particularly because this, the federal response has been so truncated, uh, anemic, pick a great word for that. But normally we would be seeing a lot more assistance. And right now to cover the different additional expenses that we have to take care of people in the city, we're just spending the money that we feel we have to because we know the federal response will be too slow or the state response will be too slow. And we're counting on the aid coming back that will make that reasonable. Now we're also doing it with an eye to that free cash that we have, that extra surplus, that rainy day fund. But we're anticipating that that aid will come. We're just not sure it's gonna come before January. I hope, so, you're, I hope you're right, but let me, let me add one more thing in there and you caught my attention when you said, you know, on the debt side of things. Um, right now, you know, we're running $12 million a year on debt servicing. Any anticipation, if, if the mayor and the staff on the executive side come back with any grandiose plans of bonding more and spending more, what's the, uh, let me throw, I'll take you off the hook, JT. Let me throw it over to the council president. What's the appetite for the 11 of you to start spending more money in this environment? Well, Joe, the problem is bonds can only be used for specific purposes, lots of times for infrastructure and things like that. So we can't take out a bond to keep people employed, unfortunately. But you have to approve the bonding that the mayor sends. Yeah, but he can't apply for a bond to say we want to keep, you know, 100 people employed. It has to be a bond for capital improvements or the, some of the things JT was talking about us slowing down a little bit on. So we don't have the option of a bond, unfortunately. Yet. 
Yeah. Yeah. Unless something changes. And yeah. as JT mentioned, I don't count on the state or federal government to get any of this done anytime soon. So. Well, let me go back. Uh, I don't want to pound it because I know that there is, if there's anything, and I say this in most of the shows, if there's anything that we are all certain of, it's the uncertainty that we're in today. So it sounds like, it sounds like an old adage and it is, it's probably older than I am. Um, let's just hope that the work that the council and that the mayor have to do um, in the month, in the weeks, in the months coming forward, um, the city is relying on public health, public safety, public works. Those are the priorities. The trash gets picked up, the potholes get filled, our kids get educated, and that's a story for tomorrow with the superintendent of schools. But I want to give both of you free form. We, we uh, Matt, free form. Anything else on the council from last week? No, I would say the budget is the biggest concern coming up, and uh, we were hoping. Uh, to start it up at a regular time. I'm not sure if it's going to be ready at the time that we usually expect it. And I think, you know, JT mentions that we don't have much power in it, which is unfortunate. We do have the power to cut, and we do take that responsibility very seriously. A few years ago, we did more cuts than I've ever seen, and that was a million dollars in cuts. So a million dollars in a $250, $250 million budget isn't much. Um, so we're going to be looking at cuts upon cuts possibly um and then just the other thing too is um you know we decided um to do regular committee meetings with some committee of the whole meetings so that we don't lose track of our time because one of the things i hate is with the budget is we are pigeonholed to only make cuts and then we also lose an entire month uh for other important matters like legislative matters or land use and we decided well before the coronavirus after the pandemic that we would try a different approach. And now because of this, uh, it's even more reason for us to try a new approach. So we've already lost a few months to COVID-19 and we're hoping to uh, continue the budget process as long as that is necessary to happen. We're gonna make, get that done and then we're also gonna get other things done. JT, back over to you. Well, you know, I, I'm looking forward to getting it done. I, I am just gonna say that we are doing it differently. We're gonna have a public hearing very early on in the process, shortly after we receive it, instead of just having it be a decorative thing at the end, because it's gonna be important, because we're gonna to have to make these big, big priority decisions. And I will say that, you know, this job, while traditionally it has been just about cutting, I, I don't think I or any of my colleagues got elected to simply go along with the way things had been. It's gonna be about more than just sharpening our pencils and finding the right places to do cuts. It's gonna be about advocating for creative new approaches. And that's, that's the work that's happening behind the scenes. Um, and I don't think anybody on the council has the appetite for an extended period of austerity that hurts the workers and families of the city. So we'll find a way to make it happen. It's a tough time, but opportunity knocks in the most adverse of times. I wanna thank council president, Matt McLaughlin and ward two counselor and uh, chair of the finance committee for the city council. JT Scott, as always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Joe.